remember um, we had um, like a lecture or kind of like a tip session from some of the senior medical students. And I remember some of them said, you know, make sure you take some time for yourself. Dr. Valentina Bonev. We are gonna do some fun oncology today. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to have you here. So we are gonna talk about uh, breast surgical oncology. Mm -hmm. What is that? So it can be kind of confusing for uh, patients because when they see me, they're like, oh, you're an oncologist? I already have an oncologist. And I say, well, I'm, I'm a surgeon. They're like, oh, but so I need a surgeon and an oncologist and a surgical oncologist. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what it means is I'm, uh, I did a special fellowship. I applied for a fellowship after general surgery residency. And so I am trained to treat patients with breast cancer, but I also see a lot of patients with benign breast disease and treat them as well. Interesting. Okay. So surgical oncology specializing in the breast. Yes. And there's also <laughs> surgical oncologists like yep. you just brought up who can operate on the breast and are trained in that, but they also operate for cancers all over the body, like yeah. colon cancer, gastric cancer, et cetera. So I'm just yep. breast dedicated. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Uh, I, ha I have a friend who is an ENT trained a uh, surgeon who specializes in in tumors and cancers of the head and neck. Um, the orthopedic world has uh, uh, oncology uh, orthopods. There, uh, unfortunately, is cancer that havocs every part of our body, and therefore we need surgeons to help with every part of the body. How did you get interested in um, in surgical oncology of the breast? So when I was a medical student as a third year, uh, when you're rotating on the wards, my first rotation was surgery. And I mean, I did not know what was going on. I started on <laughs> orthopedics. I mean, <laughs> you just go wherever they throw you. Then after yep. that was vascular. And then after that was surgical oncology. And I happened to work with a couple of the surgical oncologists and um, as well as a breast surgical oncologist. And I loved working with them. Um, I was able to work with them in the clinic. I assisted them in the operating room. I was able to be on mastectomies with them, lumpectomies. Um, I enjoyed going to tumor board with them and learning from uh, the patient cases. So I just fell in love with surgery. I was very passionate. Um, about uh, breast disease and I got involved with, they became my mentors and I did uh, research with them. And I mean, that's uh, how it all started. <laughs> <laughs> From that description, it didn't sound like you were potentially interested in surgery when you started off on this path. I was interested in surgery, but to be honest, I really didn't know enough about it. Okay, okay, interesting. But you found that you liked the OR enough. Uh, I love and the OR. The patient population and the disease pathology enough to uh, to yeah. go down this path. Um, yeah. So, what what is the the training path? A, a common question we like to ask here: to become a um, a breast surgical oncologist. What does that look like? Sure. So um, four years of medical school and during your like third or fourth year of medical school, you apply for general surgery residency and that is um, a match process. So what that means is th that is what it is now. I don't know if it will change in the future, perhaps, but um, you apply to a certain number of programs, you interview at a certain number of programs, and then you create a rank list of where you want to go and then each program creates a rank list and then you're matched okay yep. now um, during general surgery residency breast surgery is part of the curriculum but it may be um, intertwined within a general surgery rotation or surgical oncology rotation but you are required to do a certain number of uh, breast surgeries in order to complete your program um, and so then after five years of general surgery residency residency in fourth year, you're going to apply for a breast surgical oncology fellowship. And it's the same thing. It's a match process. Um, so you go wherever you end up matching and it's a one year fellowship. But like I mentioned earlier, surgical oncologists 
um, they do get breast training as, as well as other training for other uh, types of cancers in the body. And that fellowship, I believe, is a two-year fellowship. Okay. So you didn't do a general surgical oncology fellowship and you just decided to specialize after that. It is a Great. dedicated special yeah. fellowship. Yeah. All I do all day, every day is breast. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, so the the patient population, I think, is very uh, important because, mm. I mean, that's that's who you're interacting with all day, every day. Right. Talk talk about the the process for you, kind of falling in love with that patient population. What was that like for you? So I, of course, I see mainly females, but I do see some male patients as well yep. for breast cancer, which is rare, but I still have patients like that. And then I also see males for uh, benign breast disease, such as gynecomastia, or, or some of them may present with a mass and then it ends up just being benign. But yes, I definitely see uh, mainly females and my patient population ranges from teenagers, so technically a pediatric population um all the way up to essentially 100 years old wow. or around 100. so i have a wide range of patients um most of my patients i would say are uh, middle-aged but i definitely get um, younger patients um, who maybe i need to operate on or maybe they come see me because they do have that family history of breast cancer and they want to make sure that they're being appropriately uh, screened early yeah Interesting. Okay. Well, I know you have uh, some presentation for us, so I'd love to jump into that. And then for anyone listening, ask your questions. I'll, I'll be reading them and uh, we'll, we'll bring them up as I see them come across. And then hopefully we'll have some time for some Q&A at the end. Okay. Let's get into it. All right. So we're going to learn about making the cut. Okay. So I'm going to talk about my um, journey into medical school, general surgery residency, and breast surgery fellowship, and I'm going to uh, dive in deeper to um, what we were just talking about, and then uh, we'll go over expectations, how to succeed, what my breast surgery practice is like, and then we'll wrap up with a patient case. So we did touch upon this, but I wanted to emphasize all the years of training that it took to become a breast surgical oncologist. So if you go all the way back to undergraduate, all the way through fellowship, that is 14 years of education and uh, training. So quite a lot, right? And uh, 10 years if you uh, just count medical school through um, all my surgical training. Um, and uh, I did go to University of California, Irvine for both undergraduate and uh, medical school, Loma Linda for general surgery residency, and then uh, Northwestern Medical Center in downtown Chicago. So uh, when you're applying to medical school, you're super excited to get in. Uh, but then once you get in, you realize, oh my gosh, there is so much information I need to know. And it's uh, the analogy they gave us on the first day of medical school totally holds true. It's like you're drinking water from a fire hose. It's impossible. There's just so much information that you need to learn. And uh, not just in medical school, but in residency and then in beyond. So it's really trying to decide what's important and uh, filtering out um, uh, uh, details that you really need to know and other things that you can just look up. So um, for my medical school, it was comprised of didactic lectures, um, simulation labs, anatomy lab with cadavers, um, and then of course your step one and two exams. Um, but uh, since uh, I did my uh, schooling, I know more and more medical schools are moving away from didactic lectures, including my school that I went to, and now they're more problem-based learning curriculum. So meaning, they will uh, present with uh, maybe like renal disease and they will base uh, curriculum and, and uh, uh, questions and patient examples and learn from that versus we're going to start with chapter one. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's, it's much more interesting with problem-based learning. So um, once you do hit the wards, you are going to have uh, core clinical rotations. And they're going to consist of surgery, internal medicine, family medicine, pediatrics, ob psychiatry, neurology, emergency medicine. And then beyond that, you may or may not have uh, radiology, which I did, a research rotation, 
Um, and then electives. And there are tons of electives to choose from because there's so many specialties out there that you may not even uh, be aware of. Um, um, so uh, if you're at all interested or have a curiosity, you can you know, rotate on anesthesiology, dermatology, et cetera. So what about breast surgery? There's no specific rotation on that. And we talked about that earlier. Um, you'll have a surgical rotation and you may or may not actually have exposure to breast surgery. So for me, I remember I um, started a week on orthopedic surgery, which not everyone had orthopedic surgery. That was a, um, a specialty uh, that they put me on and everyone was on different specialties. And after that was vascular surgery. And after that was surgical oncology, where I happened to work with um, a breast surgeon and a surgical oncologist. But some students may actually end up not having any ex exposure to breast surgery or for example, orthopedic surgery, if, you, if you're not happen to uh, be put on that uh, elective. So if you at all have any curiosity or any interest, try to get one of those rotations so you can at least get that exposure and you know, see if it's a good match for you. So during rotations, it's like deer in headlights, you're just trying to find where do you fit in you don't want to stand in someone's way and then oh my gosh when you're in the operating room they're just watching you like a hawk because they know you're a medical student and they do not want you to contaminate the sterile field so you're just very awkward just trying to find your place and bearings and then it's just so much going on and and just trying to you know figure out <laughs> what to do. So um, I talked about mentorship and I think that's really important. And I think finding even a senior medical students is important because they can give you advice since they've just recently um, gone through what you're going through and can give you advice like maybe um, uh, books to study from, resources. Uh, it's also helpful to find a, a, a resident or a fellow because once you're in medical school, that's the next step and you want to see if if you're interested in that lifestyle, that speciality, et cetera. And then an attending is important because they can give you all the wisdom, they've completed all their training, and then they can also serve um, as a great role model and a potential letter of recommendation uh, uh, writer for you. <clears throat> so it's important to keep reading, ask questions, show that you're interested, be enthusiastic, and be proactive. So if you can join an interest group, for me, I, I participated. I was also involved on a, a leadership role and we had fun um, surgical events. Um, I also, like I said, was interested in uh, uh, breast cancer and I did uh, research with my mentors, which we ended up uh, publishing and I presented as well. So it was all excellent experience for me. So, um, General surgery residency, it is uh, five years and um, it could actually be longer. It could be a six or seven year program because there are some programs out there where they will require a one or two year research uh, years. Um, you also have some programs will also allow you if they don't have a mandatory um, research year for you to do that. And um, that helps if, of course, if you're interested in research or um, you're planning on uh, applying to a really competitive uh, fellowship and they uh, expect you to have published, presented, and to do um, uh, long-term long uh, research. So um, in terms of residency, there are some uh, core rotations as well as some um, other elective rotations towards the bottom. So you definitely will rotate on a trauma rotation, which may be combined with acute care surgery which is seeing patients uh, in the ER for appendicitis and you need to operate on them or cholecystitis. Um, bariatric and minimally invasive tend to be combined. So minimally invasive is gonna be a laparoscopic surgery um, and robotic surgery. Uh, pediatric surgery, vascular, colorectal, um, surgical oncology, you will have a gastroenterology rotation and you'll uh, learn how to do um, upper endoscopy and then colonoscopy, and you actually have to uh, pass a special test for endoscopy in order to um, um, get your board certification in surgery, um, among other things. Um, transplant rotation, uh, general surgery, 
heartburn, uh, cardiothoracic, ENT, uh, you'll likely, you probably will have at least um, a month or uh, so of a research rotation if you don't already have a year long uh, research project. Um, and uh, I, I ended up doing a, a breast uh, cancer research project. So again, what about breast surgery? There's no actual dedicated uh, breast surgical oncology, but you will see breast surgeons or breast uh, surgeries when you're on the general surgery rotation, uh, because general surgeons, they are trained in breast surgery and they do perform breast surgery. Um, you will see it when you do your surgical oncology rotation. And then you may even see it when you're rotating on acute care surgery because some patients will present to the emergency room because they have a breast abscess and you need to drain it. D so, Dania, yeah. Dania asked um, if you could elaborate more on this fun surgical events that you talked about. <laughs> sure. So we had um, Suture Skills Lab. We um, uh, bought uh, pig's feet from grocery stores. Oh, yeah. How to, how to suture, because to, that was the closest thing that we could use. We also tried orange peels, which, which is hard, but it's closest to like suture on the back. We had um, knot tying um, stations. Uh, we also had... I mean, one, I remember one of the days we had the attendings come in on a Saturday and we, they'd give like a little spiel on like what their practice is like. And then we had a resident talk about that. And then we went, I remember in the ENT clinic and he showed us um, his special um, scopes that he used. So um, those were like hands-on uh, surgical skills, which is fun. We also had um, surgery speed networking, which is a take on speed dating. So that was really fun because we would have plastic surgeons, general surgeon, colorectal, et cetera, all the surgical specialties. And you spend like five minutes or 10 minutes with them and you get to ask whatever questions you want. And then time's up, you go to the next surgeon and you go to the next surgeon. So you get to meet uh, like 10 to 20 uh, specialty surgeons and get to know a little bit more about their practice. And then perhaps you'll hit it off with one of them and say, hey, I'm really interested in your um, research project, or I'd love to um, shadow you in clinic or in surgery. Can we make that happen? So if you have the opportunity to participate in any of those events, I highly encourage it. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, awesome. Thank you. Sure. So um, as you can see in this photo, surgery is a team sport. So it's not only the attending surgeon who you're learning from, um, the resident surgeon, um, there's going to be a scrub technician, the anesthesiologist, the charge nurse in the room, um, possibly a physician assistant. So it is definitely a team sport. There are a lot of people involved in the operating room and the, as well as out of the operating room to take care of patients. And then it's also a contact sport. So you may get bodily fluids on you and you know that, that's, <laughs> the way, that's the way it is. So just be prepared. So uh, typical week in residency, um, and it, it varies you know, weekly, but uh, you'll have a cadaver lab, which you had in medical school as well. Um, journal club, where you're gonna talk about um, landmark uh, journal articles. Um, study for the APSI, which is preparing you for the general surgery board exams. Uh, research meetings, a tumor board, where you discuss patient cases. Um, didactic lectures, grand rounds, and then um, M&M, which is morbidity and mortality conference, where you um, discuss um, uh, complications on patients and how um, it can be avoided next time. Grand rounds is where usually a visiting um, uh, surgeon is invited and they talk about um, maybe a new technique or uh, new research data and they're presenting it um, um, to your hospital. And then yeah. I mentioned some of these terms. So medical student, an intern is a junior resident. It's technically a first year resident. And then um, you have uh, a resident and then you, a senior resident who's a four, fourth and fifth year general surgery resident. A fellow is someone who decided to pursue extra surgical training. And then the attending who's uh, practicing in that specialty and they've completed all their training. So like like I stated earlier, it's a it's a long way to get to the attending. Yeah, can can you go back? Because uh, yeah. I, I don't think a lot of students really understand the the ab site and, and other um, yeah. other residency specialties have have their own versions of these. Yeah, 
I don't think people understand. Once you go to med school, you're going to be taking tests basically the rest of your life. Yes. <laughs> yes. 100%. So um, med school, you have step one and two. Um, when you hit first year of residency, you need to take step three. My program uh, mandated that you had to take it like uh, at least like a couple months in. And um, so, but you definitely take it at the beginning of residency. And then um, APSI, which is the American Board of Surgery um, in training exam. So this is a, a, a long test, couple hundred questions. And we take it uh, every year. And so we, so for a general surgery residency, you take it five times. Um, during your training and it's the point is to prepare you for the American Board of, of Surgery because you want to get certified and um, you, you should be studying for this test all year long and uh, it's uh, A, B, C, D, E uh, type of questions and then when you uh, complete your training you need to take uh, your boards and for general surgery uh, it's a uh, Two, uh, two boards that you take. You take the written boards, which is the question-based test, which is an all-day test. And I think it's around 350 questions. So it's it's pretty long. It's pretty tiring. And then um, once you pass that, you take the oral board exam. So because of COVID, that's done virtually, which is great. It makes it very easy. Just like today, we're able to facilitate this no matter where we are. And that's where you're going to be tested um, on cases. And uh, it could be anything. It could be a vascular surgery patient. It could be a surgical um, ICU patient. Um, if you're lucky, you will get one breast patient and uh, they'll present you with a scenario like, okay, a 57 year old uh, male uh, had a gunshot wound in the leg. They're now in the ER, you know, blood pressure is um, 80 over 40. What do you want to do? And so working your way up. <laughs> can you just say, can I get the attending? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Phone a friend. So it's like, you got to think on your feet. You need to be prepared for all these scenarios. And even if you are like me, a breast surgeon, and I'm not going to be treating patients like that anymore, in order to get this board certification, I, I have to be able to apply all my training and be aware yeah. of you know, all these cases. So like you said, it is uh, a lot of testing, a lot of studying. And then once you are board certified, you have to recertify um, every two years now. So that's also a question-based test. So yes, you will be studying and learning your whole life. <laughs> and that's what we signed up for <laughs> <laughs> but yeah key is uh we're always learning right we're always le learning new things and um with breast surgery new things change and what um were recommendations 10 15 years ago where we're not doing anymore so um you definitely want to uh stay on top of everything so um, a typical day in general surgery or residency is going to start with pre-rounding, and that's when you're going to get sign out about overnight events from the resident. Um, you're probably going to talk to the nurse, say, hey, how did the patient do overnight? Were there, do you have any concerns for the patient, things that I need to address? Um, then you're going to start your rounds um, with your chief resident, and then if you have a fellow, and then you're going to do your formal rounds um, with your attending. So it can be a lot of rounding. After rounds, um, you're going to have a to-do list, and that's going to include uh, replenishing labs like low potassium, putting in orders, discharging patients. Simultaneously, you're going to run to the ER. You're going to see consults presented to your um, chief resident or attending, um, admit them to the hospital or, or have them uh, being taken to the operating room. You may have clinic as well that day, um, uh, surgical cases. And then you need to write notes on all the patients and then you sign out at the end of the day. So it can be a really long day. So some rotations, um, we started rounds um, as early as 5 a.m. or even earlier, just depending on the day. So you're physically in the hospital, usually around between 4 or 4.30 in the morning. Um, and the first surgery uh, typically starts uh, around uh, 7.30 in the morning. So um, you're there bright and early. It's a very, very long day. So I talked about the rotations and I wanted to just show some visuals for you. So it's just, it's a lot of variety. 
So I showed um, some colonoscopy um, photos, which by the way, colorectal surgeons um, often perform their own col colonoscopies because they may need to do it in the operating room. So that is an important skill to have. Um, next, I'm showing uh, a burn uh, victim, and this is a mesh that's grafted from a different part of their body. This could be like a, a, a plastic uh, surgery, um, making uh, markings for an augmentation. This is going to be an angiogram that a vascular surgeon is going to use in terms of uh, surgical planning. Um, this is uh, a pediatric patient. This is a baby who unfortunately has dead bowel that will need to be resected. Um, this is a CT scan um, from a patient uh, with appendicitis. So this is a dilated, uh, thickened wall of the appendix. This is someone in the ER who had um, a gunshot wound to, to the chest and they had an emergency um, uh, uh, thoracotomy. So you're essentially cracking open the chest and this is a life-saving procedure with extremely high morbidity. And then um, this is vascular surgery with a dead toe. So you do some amputation. <laughs> and, and that's the plane you buy because you're a RIT surgeon. Well, you know what? <laughs> I included the the uh, the plane because you know on transplant transplant surgery, yeah you may need a helicopter uh, which which I, I I've never been in a helicopter but we had to have a private plane where we had to go harvest the organ so obtain the organ and then bring it back and transplant it so um, it can be anywhere in California or it could be in um, I'm I'm in California or it could be in other states as well so that was a pretty interesting. Um, rotation with a transplant because it's unlike any other rotation but yeah. it's very um they call it feast or famine so it could be extremely busy so to harvest an organ and then to bring it back and transplant it i mean that could it's usually happens at night of course <laughs> always <laughs> you're right harvesting the organ in the middle of the night you bring it back and then you start transplanting it in the early morning hours and you know it's 3 p.m. I'm looking at the clock and I'm like, wow, I'm still in the operating room. I'm so tired. <laughs> I've been here all night and all day. And then the next day could be a pretty quiet day where you're just yeah. rounding on um, all your patients. So it's a it can be a very volatile rotation, and definitely you need to think about that um, in terms of lifestyle if you're really interested in that. Um, I got I got to harvest uh, on rotation when I was a medical student during yeah. my surg surgery rotation. Unfortunately, we didn't get to on the plane. It was just a drive down into the city. So, so yeah, <laughs> there's no drive down. So yeah, it every everyone's experience is different. Yeah. But what everyone will be learning in um, their surgery residency is they're going to learn how to do open surgery. So I have an ex exploratory laparotomy with a midline incision, and mm -hmm. those are the intestines. Although there are interns coming into surgery saying, when can I do robotic surgery? No, 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 no. You need to learn how to walk before you can learn big how to Big to small, walk. big to small. Come on. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> and once you master how to do open surgery, you're going to learn minimally invasive or laparoscopic. So I'm showing you the trochars in the abdomen. And then this is um, um, looking at the, you have the surgeon here and um, the assistant here, and they're watching on the video monitor. And then you can learn uh, robotic surgery, which I'm actually certified in, except I don't get to use robotic surgery and breast surgery uh, because it's not applicable. But I will tell you, it sure is a lot of fun to do breast surgery. And um, it's great for using um, in pelvic surgery. And that's why it was uh, developed. So as you can see, so the patient would be here. This is the uh, robot. And then this is the uh, surgeon who's not at bedside, but he's in the operating room in a corner working on a console, and he's able to essentially uh, manipulate the uh, robotic arms. So you get excellent visualization, much better um, than you can when you're using um, laparoscopic surgery. And then you also have um, seven degrees of movement. So it is, uh, it, it is a lot of fun uh, using robotic surgery, but I don't get to use it anymore. So. <laughs> so um, after uh, residency, I knew I wanted to do fellowship, and I was um, so grateful to get accepted into Northwestern and to do my one-year uh, program. Um, I lived in Chicago for a year, and I had an amazing experience there, and um, the city was so much fun, and there were tons of 
history and architecture and museums and restaurants. And I had a wonderful experience when um, I had my uh, I had a weekend off or a night off. And um, so uh, for me, fellowship, um, it is a continuation of residency. You're building upon everything you've learned. Um, but you do have more autonomy and with that comes more expectations and you need to think of fellowship as, okay, I'm going to be an attending soon. I need to develop essentially my technique, how I want to care for my patients, trial and error of things, talk with the different attendings and, and adopt your own style of how you want to be a clinician. So um, rotations are going to include, of course, surgery. You will have a clinic, uh, radiology. You will work with the medical oncologist, uh, radiation oncology, uh, pathology. So you're going to look at uh, uh, slides from biopsies and uh, surgery, uh, physical therapy, which I thought was interesting because I never had um, that exposure when um, in any part of my training. So I thought that was really interesting learning about um, uh, lymphedema treatment and uh, research rotation, and, uh, and you can see some of the fun things I did in Chicago. I wanted to include um, some resources um, that can be helpful while you're a medical student um, or applying to medical school, so Student Doctor Network, um, Intraining.org, which I, I was a part of when I was a medical student, the Association of the American College of Surgeons, and they have a special section on careers in medicine, and then for someone who's interested in surgery, check out the American College of Surgeons and they have resources for medical students, residents and uh, fellows. And then um, ACGME is more uh, for uh, residency training. Um, some resources that I use in my practice, so um, NCCN or the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. So I started using that when I found out about it as a medical student. So this has all the guidelines for cancer patients and not just breast, so any type of cancer. And um, those are really important to use and we definitely discuss them often in our tumor boards. Breast360.org, which I wrote a couple of articles for, it's a free resource for uh, patients for all things breast related. It's a great resource for the patients. And then the American Society of, of Breast Surgeons and they have uh, guidelines. So. Uh, those are, you know, great resources if you're interested in uh, uh, breast surgery. Awesome. So um, I mentioned this earlier. There are really three ways to become a breast surgeon. So um, a general surgeon, if you choose not to do fellowship, which, which is totally fine, um, you can do breast surgery. However, you're going to do most likely tons of other surgeries such as um, uh, append uh, app appendectomy, uh, hernia repair, uh, and so forth. And oftentimes a general surgeon, I mean, it depends if they're in a, a rural area or if they're in, in, in the city, but um, they may end up doing literally a handful of surgeons. However, if you're a rural surgeon or there's not a lot of resources out there, you may be doing more. Um, so if you want to get that extra training uh, specifically how to treat breast cancer patients, patients who are high risk for breast cancer, um, surgical techniques, you're going to do a breast uh, surgical oncology fellowship. And then if you're interested in operating on cancer, but not just breast, then you would do a surgical oncology fellowship where you're, like I said, learn about melanoma surgery, breast surgery, and so forth. So my week as a breast surgeon does consist of clinic, um, I sometimes do in-office small procedures. Um, I operate mainly at surgery centers, but from time to time I will operate in a hospital depending on the surgery I'm performing um, and the patient's comorbidities. Um, I still have to write notes. I have to write orders. We do have tumor boards where we discuss our patients and come up with uh, recommendations. Um, I do meet with primary doctors in the community in order to build a referral base. And then um, I uh, like to participate in patient and community outreach and then student educational events such as uh, this. So I'm hoping that my experience and what I've learned will 
help others and, you know, maybe give them an idea about breast surgery. Maybe they'll fall in love with it. Maybe they won't and that's okay. And they'll pick something else that they find that they really love. So um, even though I'm a surgeon, clinic is still really important. And um, I, I think I, I actually like the balance between surgery and clinic, and it does give a good time to build rapport with the patient. And not every patient I see is a surgical patient uh, either. Uh, most of my patients, though, I will see uh, even uh, for years, but I do sometimes get those one-time consults um, where you're just evaluating, you know, is this a lump? Is this normal? Yes, it's normal. Nothing to worry about. Or let's work it up. And yep, everything turned out normal. Yeah. And then um, you definitely have to see a patient first in clinic before you can operate. <laughs> yes. uh, Unless it's an emergency. <laughs> in, yeah. in breast, there's not too many of those. <laughs> So in my clinic, um, like I said, I'm, I treat benign breast disease, so breast pain or nostalgia is a very common complaint among women. I see patients for breast cyst, and I have um, a little picture of a breast cyst. It's a classic um, cyst, and I will aspirate those in the clinic. A breast lump, a fibroadenoma is the uh, most common benign breast lump. Gynecomastia, which you can see in men. And then sometimes I just see women for this, their annual breast exam and mammogram. Um, I also get referrals for patients who have an abnormal uh, breast imaging or a biopsy. And the question is, why is it abnormal? What's the next step? Um, I see patients um, who need to be evaluated to determine if they are high risk for breast cancer so we can determine a plan for them. I will uh, do genetic testing on my patients um, if they are high risk for breast cancer. And um, I will, of course, see cancer patients and then mainly females, but I do see males as well. Um, I do sometimes some in-office procedures, but they're small, like a punch biopsy, um, uh, sometimes a needle biopsy, and then uh, cyst aspiration. Um, actually, yesterday I did a needle aspiration of a breast abscess. Um, in terms of surgeries, uh, portacath removal, so that's someone who had chemotherapy um, that's a small procedure, um, but what I bulk of my procedures is going to be an excisional biopsy, a lumpectomy for cancer, a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, we don't do axillary lymph node dissection as much anymore, um, although I do have one on the books. Um, a modified radical mastectomy we don't do as much anymore, but I definitely do a total mastectomy and then um, a nipple sparing or skin sparing mastectomy um, often, I, and I do have a diagram of that the following slide. So I just wanted to compare and contrast between a breast surgeon and a general surgeon. So like I said, I'm breast dedicated all day, every day, breast only. Um, most of my surgeries are outpatient. I do have a lot of continuity of care. So for example, if it's a breast cancer patient, I will see that patient for years. And uh, one of the reasons is because we want to make sure we catch a recurrence early. Um, it's multidisciplinary management, so I work with medical oncologists, uh, the radiologists, radiation oncologists, the physical therapists, um, geneticists. I do work with a lot of specialists, and in particular with breast cancer patients, so it does take a whole uh, team approach. Um, there is the balance of clinic and surgery. I have to stay up to date with breast management, and I see mainly female patients. Um, as stated before, with a general surgeon, um, uh, you're going to perform a variety of procedures. Um, sometimes you may just have one and done surgeries, like an ingle hernia repair, and, and you never see that patient again. And I mean, I do have patients like that too. For example, if I see someone um, with in her 20s who has a large fibroadenoma, I'll remove that, and they essentially don't need any follow up from me. And um, as long as they just continue to get uh, breast exams from their primary care doctor, um, general surgeon will take call and then they'll uh, perform um, inpatient in outpatient surgeries. So um, if there aren't any questions right now, we'll just wrap it up with one case. So I wanted to talk about um, a 62 year old postmenopausal Hispanic female who uh, was referred to me with a known BRCA1, which we'll talk about in the next slide, pathogenic mutation, who was presenting for discussion of risk reduction mastectomy. 
So she initially presented to her primary care doctor because she had right lower quadrant abdominal pain. And when you hear right lower quadrant uh, pain, your first thought is going to be appendicitis. Well, they did a CT scan and it turned out her ovary um, was abnormal and she had stage three ovarian cancer. So she ended up seeing a gynecology oncologist and they operated on her. They performed a hysterectomy and they removed both her fallopian tubes and her ovaries. That is uh, part, part of the treatment for um, her ovarian cancer. And then uh, her medical oncologist gave her adjuvant chemotherapy. Because of her ovarian cancer diagnosis, they rightfully performed genetic testing on her and they determined that she was BRCA1 uh, positive. They also tested her daughter, which was great, and her daughter ended up being positive as well. So she needs to be managed uh, for that. Um, the patient has high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes. She was obese on exam, but she otherwise had a benign breast exam. No other history of breast or ovarian cancer in the family. So um, you may or may not have heard that there are uh, quite a, there are a few genes associated with the increased breast cancer risk. The ones that we know the most about are going to be BRCA1 and 2, um, but there are, like I listed, other uh, genes as well that are associated with the increased risk, but to a lesser um, extent. Now, if we compare them. Um, BRCA1 and 2, depending on your family history, you can have a risk of uh, estimated lifetime risk of breast cancer around 80%. So that's extremely high. But if you look at the other spectrum, there are other genes such as the CHECK2, which I actually had a couple of patients this week with that uh, mutation. Um, you can have an estimated lifetime risk of uh, 20 to 40 percent of breast cancer. And, and since I mentioned CHECK2, there's also an increased risk of colorectal cancer. So they need to see a gastroenterologist. So uh, with both uh, BRCA1 and 2, of course, there's the increased risk of breast cancer, which is quite high. There's also a risk of male breast cancer, which is a very important to note. So if you ever see a male breast cancer patient, you want them to undergo genetic testing to see if they test positive for one of these genes. Um, and, it, and that's not specifically for the patient. It's for the patient's family as well, correct? Yes. Yeah. For the pa So if you get a male with breast cancer, you want to test them. And then if uh, family members as well. So in this particular case with this patient, it's a female. She has a daughter who they tested. It was positive. And then she has a son who had not undergone testing and the recommendations for him to undergo testing. Because if he were to test positive, then he definitely has an increased risk of male breast cancer. So if you look at the uh, general population, it is very rare. Yeah. Um, she had ovarian cancer, um, uh, which is not unexpected based on uh, her gene mutation status. And then there is a risk of uh, pancreatic cancer and then prostate cancer as well. So of course it doesn't apply to this patient, but affects male family members. So you definitely want family members to get tested for this. So uh, we talked about performing a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy, um, but she, she wanted to wait uh, about half a year or so because she had essentially just undergone all her treatment she just finished her treatment for ovarian cancer and she was just burned out she just she just wanted some time to process this BRCA1 uh, mutation diagnosis and to process my conversation with her about a prophylactic mastectomy and the point of that is because she's at such a high risk of breast cancer we want to prophylactically remove benign breast tissue to lower her risk to average risk of uh, breast cancer or even lower than average risk. And so um, the two types of mastectomies is a nipple sparing where the incision is gonna be in the inframammary fold and the breast uh, essentially looks the same or a skin sparing mastectomy where you remove the nipple areolar complex. And these options are for patients who want reconstruction, which she did. Um, there's also the option of doing a total mastectomy where um, all, of, all of this is gone and uh, the chest is flat. So um, she ended up seeing a plastic surgeon and um, she wanted to proceed with a prophylactic uh, mastectomy. We performed a skin sparing mastectomy based on her um, anatomy. So we did remove the nipple areolar complex. 
and uh, I performed the surgery and the plastic surgeon placed a temporary implant, which is called a tissue expander. And then several months later, it was exchanged for a silicone breast implant. Um, it, you know, it's a conversation with the patient and the plastic surgeon, what type of implant they want. And uh, each implant has its silicone versus saline, uh, its own um, effects on how it looks, how it feels for patients. So it's a conversation with the plastic surgeon. Are we are we seeing more breast cancer now? I, I have just just recently two physician friends who just went through um, prophylactic mastectomies and and everything because of BRCA and stuff. Are, are we seeing it more? Are we just testing more for BRCA, and so we're catching potentially? We're we're testing cancer? more. I think we're testing more. So. Uh, 10, 20 years ago when genetic testing first came out, they only tested for BRCA1 and 2. The testing was not that good. Now you can test for around 80 gene panel. So of course, not just breast cancer genes, but also pancreatic cancer, colorectal cancer. And I test for all those. I do a full panel often for my patients. And um, the testing is improved. We um, have now found out like there's other genes associated with breast cancer, like CHECK2. So, a patient who tests now for CHECK2, we now know they have a breast cancer risk, but if they tested 10 years ago for just BRCA1 and 2, they would be negative, and we would never know that they are at such an increased risk for breast cancer and colorectal cancer. So um, also genetic testing was extremely expensive. It was thousands of dollars, like five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 when it first came out. Now it's oftentimes uh, the cost is completely covered by insurance or it's up to a hundred dollars. So it's definitely That's more affordable, cool. but patients will bring up that concern. When I bring up genetic testing, their first um, big concern is going to be the cost and yeah. because it has been known to be quite expensive. So now it's more accessible. It's more affordable. Uh, more and more doctors have this in their practice. So not just breast surgeons, your primary care doctor could offer this testing too. So it could be, um, you know, really helpful. Right. So this patient, it's multi multidisciplinary management. Because she's had the prophylactic mastectomy, I now just see her for an annual breast exam. She no longer gets mammograms because there's really nothing to mammogram anymore. So she just gets breast exam, which is really important for her since she has no other method of screening. And even though we did do a prophylactic mastectomy, I do get asked this by patients. Well, if I get a mastectomy, I will have a zero risk of breast cancer, right? No, that's not true. You will still have a risk of breast cancer, but it will be quite low. And the reason why you still have a risk of breast cancer is because you will still have breast tissue uh, there because we need to leave some tissue to perfuse the skin. So it's impossible also to remove every single tiny little breast cell. And we know that because uh, uh, years ago when uh, uh, patients had breast cancer, they had uh, a very big gruesome surgery where they removed the entire breast, the lymph nodes in the um, armpit and uh, the muscle in the chest as well. And some of those patients still got breast cancer again years later, some of them decades later when supposedly all the tissue is removed. So it's just simply impossible. So um, this patient's going to follow up with uh, Guy and Ong for her ovarian cancer, as well as medical oncology. Um, she's going to see gastroenterology because of her pancreatic cancer risk. And then some of the genetic companies will offer free testing if you test positive. They'll offer free testing to your family members and uh, within a certain window. So her daughter got, te got testing and uh, we recommended that other family members get testing and then as well as her adult son. And then of course, she's gonna follow up with her primary care doctor. So just to summarize, about 10% uh, of breast cancers are actually uh, hereditary and genetic testing for gene mutations associated with cancer should be considered in patients who have breast cancer or are high risk for breast cancer. And the results may affect not only the patient, but also family members, and it can affect uh, management and screening of breast cancer as well as other cancers for themselves and their family. So thank you. Wow, good stuff. Um, if you want to ask a question, Caitlin has her hand raised, very, very prompt. Caitlin, if you want to ask a question, you can unmute. 
Hi, uh, thank you so much for doing this. I, I appreciate your time. Um, I worked in ob for a few years and found that fibroadenomas were hard to explain to patients. Um, so my question for you is, when you have a patient referred to you from primary care or ob for fibroadenoma, and the patient asks you, what caused this? Why did I get this? Um, how do you answer that? And then my second question is, for those cases that get referred to you, how often are they actual surgical, actually surgical, or how often do you um, just recommend expectant management with those patients? For a fibroadenoma, so it's the most common uh, benign breast mass, and it's going to be hormonally driven. So, mm. uh, like I said, I have patients ranging from uh, starting teenager, right? So uh, it's going to be younger patients, can be teenagers, and then those essentially like less than really 40 years old are really going to be fibroadenomas. And those that's because those are the ones who are menstruating. The fibroadenomas are going to oftentimes classically actually fluctuate in size with uh, uh, periods. And so uh, for me, and I follow following American uh, Society of Breast Surgeons, if a patient has a fibroadenoma that's growing, um, it's painful. I've had a couple of teenagers who came in who had fibroadenomas for a couple of years, and it was got into the point where it was over four centimeters and it was dis disfiguring the breast. Um, so, um, so it's affecting cosmesis as well. So I will op definitely operate on those patients. And, um, you know, I would say for fibroadenomas, if they have a small one, it's not bothering them. It's not really growing too much. You can just observe it. So, I mean, maybe like kind of 50, 50, I'll mm -hmm. operate and not operate on. So I'll be a little disappointed when I don't get to. Yeah, the good news is you don't need surgery. Bad news is I don't get to operate on. This. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. And I appreciate the answer. All right. Anyone else? If you have a question, you want to come on, raise your hand. Let me see. Um, just looking through the Q&A here. Um, uh, Lisa asked a question more towards uh, medical education. What habits or coping mechanisms did you employ to to help you through those fire hose moments? I remember um, we had um, like a lecture or kind of like a tip session from some of the senior medical students. And I remember some of them said, you know, make sure you take some time for yourself make sure you take time to be healthy try and you know you're going to be studying a lot try and think ahead of having some healthy snacks it's we're so busy we're studying we have tests try and get some dedicated time to at least walk go outside just take your mind off because your brain's going to be fried from all that studying and things are just going to turn into mush in your brain so you just it's sometimes nice just go outside get a little bit of exercise, go to the gym, whatever you need, get some air. And, you know, you just need to take a, take a little step back, you know, because it's a big thing is going to be mental health and you really want to avoid burning out because once you burn out, it's really, really hard to get back mentally where you feel like, yes, I can, I can hit the ground running. And yeah. it's even harder with residency because residency is, surgery residency is much harder than medical school the hours the information the stress you have taking care of all these patients critically ill emergencies so when you do have those um you know day off or two try and try and you know make some mental health time for yourself yeah there's a few questions kind of similar theme uh, obviously, breast augmentation is more and more popular these days. I don't know what the numbers are, but for you as a, a breast cancer surgeon, does that change what you're able to do or does that complicate things for you for patients who have breast cancer or, or maybe benign stuff um, after they've had breast augmentation? Um, it can. So if I have, I mean, I definitely see quite a few patients who have breast implants. So if, for example, a patient presents to me with a breast cancer and they have implants, then one of the things we discuss is, yeah. okay, let's get a plastic surgeon involved. Um, and so we have to coordinate surgery with the plastic surgeon. And it, does the patient want to keep their implants? Do, 
do they do they want a revision do they want the remove so it, it's you know we have to plan around that in terms of my um, examining the patient if a patient uh, presents with a lump sometimes that lump is essentially pushed to the forefront by the implant however if that breast lump is behind the implant they may feel it like internally but i won't be able to feel it because the implant is essentially blocking it so yeah. we would get imaging for the patient yeah. and, and when patients get mammograms uh, the technicians have to be very careful and let the patient know there is a possibility of uh rupture, rupture. because yeah. mammogram you're compressing the breast so that is yeah. that's something patients need to be aware about uh, I'm assuming the implants affect uh, ultrasound ability. Um, I I don't th I don't think it really does. I mean, you mm -hmm. can see it pop up on the implant, and I mean, usually with the ultrasound probe, you can kind of like gently shift <laughs> the implant to kind of <laughs> you know, get, get your view in there. So I think with ultrasound, they can you know work their way around. Versus with the mammogram, it's just like. <laughs> yeah, I, I always picture it's almost like maneuvering a breech baby. You're like, get out of the way. Like, exactly. Maneuvering <laughs> around it. Yeah, it takes a little yeah. bit of finesse. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Dr. Valentina Bonev, thank you so much for your time today, your your expertise in sharing your wisdom with everyone. Uh, I appreciate I appreciate thank it. So I appreciate much you for having me. Yeah. Thank you everyone for coming and learning and hopefully we'll have some future breast surgeons in the audience. Okay, great. Take care. <laughs> Bye everyone.